So a basic question in education is how we can improve uh, and measure the quality of teachers. Uh, now one approach that's increasingly taking hold in the US and many other OECD countries is the use of what's called uh, value-added measures. So this is just a simple idea of evaluating teachers based on their impacts on students' test scores. If you're a teacher who systematically tends to raise your students' test scores relative to the prior year, we call you a high-value-added teacher. And if you're a teacher who, unfortunately, systematically reduces your students' test scores <laughs> relative to the prior year, we'd uh, call you a low-value-added teacher. Now, school districts have started to use such value-added measures in the US and other countries, and that has led to considerable debate in policy circles. So, for example, Washington, D.C. laid off about 200 teachers uh, and also offers bonuses using a, a metric that partially is based on this value-added uh, concept. The Los Angeles Times, in an even more controversial uh, move, publishes the value-added by name of 12,000 public school teachers. So you can look up your child's uh, teacher's value-added and then go talk to the principal about possibly switching your child to a different class, etc. So, uh, now, this, the use of these measures is very highly debated, basically for two reasons. that They boil down to two uh, academic debates. The first is a dispute about whether value-added measures are biased. Now, bias in this context is not just some statistical technicality. It's extremely important for the use of these measures. And, and the idea is very simple. So we see that test score gains are systematically higher for, say, Mrs. Smith relative to Mrs. Jones. Uh, does that actually reflect the causal impact of Mrs. Smith? Is she actually doing a better job than Mrs. Jones? Or is she just getting different types of kids who, for whatever reason, are having higher levels of achievement? If it's the latter, which would be a biased story rather than the former, then if you're starting to fire teachers on the basis of these measures, you're, you're firing the wrong people, right? That's not, that's not good. Uh, so that's one issue. The second issue is that there's a lack of evidence on teachers' long-term impacts. So even, uh, there's quite a bit of evidence suggesting that teachers have systematic effects on students' test scores. But at the end of the day, we don't just want to raise test scores. What we actually care about, uh, the reason we're educating students is we, we care about long-term outcomes, things like earnings, college attendance, other social outcomes. And so you want to know whether the teachers who raise test scores, which is what these value-added measures capture, are they also improving students' long-term outcomes? And we know nothing, basically, about the second question, and the first question is quite debated. And so what we're going to do in this study is address both of those questions. And we're going to do that by making use of uh, a, a really great uh, data resource where we're able to track 2.5 million children in America from a major school district in the US, a large city, uh, from childhood to early adulthood. So basically, we can um, take these 2.5 million kids, and we see them from around, uh, say, age 8, so we see them in elementary school, and we can ask the question, how did the teachers you had as a child affect how you're doing when we see you at age 25 or age 30? Uh, which really allows a comprehensive analysis of these two questions, as you'll see. So we're going to do two things. First, we're going to develop new tests for bias in these value-added estimates. And I use this term quasi-experimental. That, I think, is the, one of the most important uh, changes in modern applied microeconomic research and economics is the use of quasi-experimental methods. So this just refers to the idea that the reason uh, economists have such a hard time, I think, uh, providing very concrete advice to ministers is that we can't run systematic experiments like scientists can. But I think we've become increasingly better at identifying uh, features of the data that essentially look like experiments. And you'll see me do this in, in today's talk. And we can get lessons that look essentially, almost essentially like what you'd learn from an experiment if you could run one. So that's the first thing we'll do. And then the second thing we'll do is test whether children who get higher value added teachers actually are doing better when they're adults. Now, aside from this debate on value added, uh, the results also shed light on broader issues in the economics of education. They're going to tell us something about the long run return, returns to investments in better teaching. And uh, they'll tell us whether impacts, teachers' impacts on test scores are a good proxy for the long-term impacts of educational intervention. So for those of you who do research in education, 
you'll know that this is really important because usually what you can study, what's practical to study is the impact of the teacher on test scores. You can't always plan to track people over 25 years and then wait and learn what happened, right? And so if we can establish here that test scores are a pretty good predictor of long-term outcomes, that validates a whole body of research in the economics of education that says things like smaller class sizes or different peer composition or different types of curricula improve test scores, you can then extrapolate from the findings we have here to how much of an earnings impact you're going to see. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about the data and then we'll uh, get into the analysis. So the data, uh, there are two different data sets that we uh, draw information from. The first is information on teacher and classroom assignments for two and a half million children spanning 1991 to 2009 from a large school district in the U.S. We also have data on these students' test scores uh, from 1989 to 2009. Uh, and these are test scores in each grade from grades three, three to eight uh, for math and reading, which are the two subjects that are, that are tested. And so that gives you information on 18 million test scores uh, spanning these five grades. And you'll see why the size of this data set is extremely important for the analysis we're gonna do. Now the second data set is information from US federal income tax returns from 1996 to 2010, uh, which includes both people who file tax returns as well as non-filers. So for instance, if you um, uh, earn money from a company and you don't file a tax return, the company's gonna directly report to the Internal Revenue Service in the US how much you earned as part of the information reporting system. So from this tax data, we get information on student, various student outcomes, earnings uh, from the tax forms, college attendance. So it turns out you know from the tax data where everybody in the US is going to college uh, because every time you pay tuition to a college, they automatically file a report with the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, we know uh, teenage birth, uh, whether you claim a dependent who was born while you were a teenager, and where you're living, we can uh, have some information about the quality of the neighborhood you're living in, among various other characteristics. So you can see that you can measure a rich variety of economic and social uh, outcomes of interest. Now, in addition, you're able to link the children back to the parents, and so you have information on the parent characteristics, things like household income, 401k savings, so that's retirement savings, home ownership, marital status, and age of childbirth, all of which are very important predictors of children's outcomes, as well known from the prior literature. And you'll see how I'll be able to use these parent characteristics to, as, um, to assess bias in the value-added estimates. Now, one of the great things about using these administrative databases is that usually when you're doing a longitudinal study over a 25-year period, you really suffer from problems of attrition where you're only able to track a small fraction of people and that creates all kinds of econometric biases. Now here we're able to match approximately 90% of the students who are in the school district data to the tax data, so attrition turns out to be a relatively minimal concern. All right, so here's what the data set looks like, just so you have in mind, uh, it, it helps structure the analysis. Okay, so we're gonna follow a kid over time, so say John, my co-author. John happened to get interested in tax analysis when he was in fourth grade, so he uh, was instructed by John Creedy, Norman Campbell, and various others in this example. Uh, and so uh, the way this works is you have one row per subject per grade in the data set, okay? So you have a row for math, a row for English, and then in the later grades in the U.S., starting in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, you have different teachers for, for each subject. But in the early grades, you have the same teacher uh, throughout the entire day. Now, one thing that you'll note is like your, your test score fluctuates across the years, obviously, but your earnings are just your earnings. So there's going to be repeated earnings data across all of these rows of the data set. And then just imagine a data set that has 18 million rows like this, okay? Uh, and so what we want to know is how the quality of teachers John had when he was a kid affect, uh, affect his earnings. And those of you who are thinking about the econometrics here, you'll know that because we have these repeated observations, there are some issues one has to deal with with standard errors, which we take care of, and I won't uh, bore you with those details. So as a uh, benchmark, I think it's useful, uh, you know, we're talking about whether test scores predict impacts in adulthood, so let's just step back for a minute, and I think it's interesting to just look at the correlations between test scores and outcomes in adulthood, not thinking about the causal impacts of teachers yet. So do students with higher test scores do better as adults, and how much better? 
So here I'm actually going to use data from an earlier study, which was uh, recently published uh, in the Berlin Journal of Economics, where we used to, um, we analyzed the impacts of kindergarten class quality. So that's a separate topic that I'm not going to talk about here. But I just want to show you the incredible correlations between kindergarten, even kindergarten test scores, very early uh, in your experience, and uh, and adult outcomes. So usually people ask me, you know, what could you possibly be testing five-year-old kindergartners on that has any predictive power? So let's let's do an uh, example. Uh, I'll say a word to you, listen for the ending sound, you circle the picture that starts with the same sound. Okay, so let's say I say cup, hopefully people here know the answer is pencil and not duck. Uh, and so the question then is, how is the kid who said duck instead of pencil doing when he's 27 years old when we see him in the tax data? And this is earnings versus your kindergarten test score, okay? So on the x-axis are percentiles of your kindergarten test score. Uh, y-axis is your earnings as reported in, in tax records when you're between the ages of 25 and 27. And I'm going to show you a bunch of scatter plots that look like this. This is based on a data set of 12,000 kids, but let me just explain how we construct this graph. So we divide the x-axis into 20 equal size bins, so 5 percentile point bins and then calculate the mean level of earnings within each of those bins. So if I just show you a raw scatter plot of 12,000 points, you'd see the upward sloping relationship, but it would just be a big blur because there's so many dots on it. So this is just a way to non-parametrically represent what that relationship looks like. And what you can see is that there's a remarkable uh, relationship between even your kindergarten test scores and how much you're earning. Uh, you can see that on the right side of this graph, you're earning two and a half times as much as the people who are at the bottom of their kindergarten class. Now, kindergarten test scores also predict, uh, highly predict college attendance rates. If you're at the bottom of your kindergarten class, you have less than a 20% chance of going to college. At the top of your kindergarten class, almost an 85% chance you're gonna to go, to, go to college. Uh, another measure we look at is what is the quality of the college that you're attending? So our proxy for the quality of the college is the average earnings of past graduates of that college, which we're able to compute from the tax data. Uh, and you can see that you're, you attend a better quality college if you scored higher in kindergarten. There are also numerous other dimensions in which you do better if you're scoring higher at the end of kindergarten. You're more likely to own a home. You're more likely to be saving for retirement. You're even more likely to be married uh, when you're uh, 27 years old if you've scored higher at the uh, end of kindergarten. Okay, so those correlations are suggestive. They suggest that if we can raise test scores uh, we're going to improve outcomes as adults, but they're definitely not conclusive. You can't conclude that the teachers who raise test scores will improve long-term outcomes, because all I've shown you so far is that test scores are correlated with outcomes in adulthood, right? So, in particular, I haven't established that there's a causal link that raising, doing an intervention that raises test scores will have commensurate impacts on outcomes in adulthood. So, for instance, it could just be that higher scoring students happen to be the ones from better family backgrounds or wealthier households, and they're doing better for some other reason, right? And so that's the purpose of the work that we're doing in this paper and that earlier study of kindergarten class quality to get at these causal impacts. So uh, the first thing uh, that we're gonna do is um, measure teachers' quality by their average impacts on students' test scores. So when I say I wanna know if higher quality teachers generate better outcomes in adulthood, I need to have some way of measuring the quality of teachers, and so the measure I'm going to use is this value-added concept as it's uh, used in, in uh, existing school districts. And I'm going to start by addressing this question of whether these value-added estimates are biased, and then I will show you uh, the evidence on long-term outcomes. Okay, so the fundamental problem here is that students are not randomly assigned to teachers. Right, so students, if there's random assignment of students to teachers, then you'd know that any differences in test score gains across teachers has to be due to the effect of the teacher rather than differences in the characteristics of the students across teachers. And so as a result, in the data as we see it, the differences in estimated value added of teachers may just reflect students sorting rather than the impacts of the teachers. Okay, so the standard approach in economics to dealing with non-random assignment is to control for uh, various factors. In particular, in the context of education, a very natural thing to control for 
which turns out to be quite important, is last year's test score. So if I'm trying to evaluate the impact of fourth grade teachers, I control for third grade teachers, uh, sorry, for your end of third grade test score. The idea being that that could not have been affected by the fourth grade teacher, and it's going to capture a lot of the variation in student ability uh, that might be there in fourth grade. So effectively what you're doing, the reason these things are called value-added measures is that you're looking at the gain in test scores from the end of third grade to the end of fourth grade. Okay, now that, I think, is, is a sensible strategy, but it's not clear whether that's sufficient to obtain unbiased estimates of teachers' impacts, and there's a very uh, controversial debate about this in the current uh, literature. Now, uh, what we're going to do is try to uh, resolve that issue by implementing a set of tests that I will show you in a second, but I first wanted to show you that these measures have some predictive content uh, for test score gains, and I'm going to do that with the following graph. So I'm going to show you several graphs that look like this. On the x-axis is the value added of the teacher measured in units of standard deviation of student test scores. So this is, seems a little bit confusing, but it's fairly straightforward. So because test scores have no natural scaling in and of themselves, we put them in standard deviation units, right? So uh, we divide the, the test score scale by the standard deviation of that scale so that moving up one standard deviation in, that, in test scores means that you're moving from like the 50th percentile to roughly the 80th percentile of the distribution, all right? So now we then compute for each teacher. Think of it as basically the average test score gain of their children relative to uh, the mean in the overall sample, which is normalized at zero. So the average test score in the sample as a whole is set to zero. And then a teacher who's here at plus 0.1 it means that they are on average raising their students' test scores by one-tenth of the standard deviation. Okay, and that's a relatively, that's like a, the typical sort of variation that you see in the data. Now what I'm plotting here is just the impact of these teachers on scores as measured in other years. So think about the following exercise. I look at a teacher who's teaching in a school district from 1990 to 1995. I use data from 1990 to 1994 to estimate the value added of that teacher. And then I ask, if I categorize all the various, let's say, teachers in this room that measured their value added, and I ask, what are the test score gains of the students who are assigned to them in 1995? How well do I do in predicting those test score gains? And what this graph is showing you is that you do an incredibly good job of predicting those test score gains. So if a teacher was classified as high value added based on past data, it means that with a you know, pretty high probability, they're going to have good test score impacts in subsequent years. Now that in and of itself, so that's a good starting point, but it doesn't in and of itself tell you anything about the bias issue, because the reason they may be having good test score impacts in subsequent years may again be because they're getting different types of kids, right? So this relationship could be either a causal effect, or it could be driven by bias in terms of which students are assigned to which teachers. So we want to figure out which of those is driving it. And so we're going to do that in two ways. The first is we're going to test whether parent characteristics are correlated with our estimates of teacher value added. So the idea here is if these estimates are unbiased, then it shouldn't be the case that the teachers who we rate as higher value added systematically get kids from richer parents than uh, kids from lower uh, socioeconomic status families. Whereas if you think it is driven by sorting, you might see such a correlation. So let me just show you this evidence. This, uh, what we do here is, sorry, let me step back for one second. We, there are many different parent characteristics, right, that we have in our data, like income, the age at which uh, the child is born, and so on, marital status. Uh, and we want to lump all of those into a single index. So an intuitive way to do that is to predict students' test scores based on all of these parent characteristics. And then for each student, just use the fitted values from that regression. So say, what is the test score you predict for each kid based on their parental background characteristics? And so then I'm going to plot those predicted test scores versus teacher value added. And that's what this figure is showing you here. So what I'm showing you in dashed gray is the, uh, is the figure that I had in the previous slide, which shows you the impact on actual test scores. And this is the impact, or kind of the placebo test, the, the relationship with predicted test scores based on parent characteristics. 
And what you should see here is that this thing is totally flat, meaning that there's no evidence that the teachers who we rate as higher value added are actually getting uh, kids from richer parents, from better families. You know, this looks really good from the perspective of bias. It says that these children are actually, they actually have higher test scores, but you would not have predicted based on the families that they would come from that they should necessarily have higher or lower test scores, which suggests that it's actually the impact of the teacher and not the fact that these children over here who have the good teachers are different from the children on the left who have the bad teachers, okay? So that's test one. That doesn't, I think that's quite reassuring, but it doesn't by itself nail it. Uh, because it could still be that in some other dimension that I'm not able to see in the data, these kids are different from the kids on the left. And so that motivates our second uh, test, which is to do the following thing. Let me just jump to this slide, which shows you uh, the nature of the exercise. The, con the idea here this comes back to what I was saying earlier about finding quasi-experiments. The quasi-experiment we're going to exploit here is the fact that teachers switch across schools uh, and grades quite a bit whereas students tend not to switch that much, all right? So here's the logic of the test. Suppose I track in a given school, call it school one, in a given grade, different cohorts of kids, okay? So let's say you come to school one in uh, 1994, where uh, Mr. Smith, who for some reason is a notoriously low value added bad teacher, was there. Uh, you had Mr. Smith in 1994, now he uh, left and started teaching in a different grade or teaching in a different school in 1995, and I come along in 1995, and there's a different teacher there who, let's say, is higher value added. Now if I compare test scores from right before to right after this change, just averaging over all the kids in that school cohort cell, I can ask that that basically gives me experimental type of variation. The logic here is these kinds of teacher switches tend to occur because of random changes in staffing needs or uh, people go on maternity leave or somebody relocates because of a spouse. It's very unlikely that students are gonna switch to a different school just because one teacher, a high value added teacher, happened to leave or enter, all right? And so you can then draw a graph that looks like this where define year zero as the year that that high value added teacher enters the school and plot average test scores for the students before in the cohorts before that teacher entered and after that teacher entered. So think of this as like 1995 in the example I gave you, that's year zero. And then this is 1994, 1993, 1992, and so on. And I'm aggregating over thousands of such entries of high value added teachers, teachers who are in the top 5% in terms of value added. And what you can see is that right when that high quality teacher enters, test scores jump up immediately. It's very hard to imagine that this is driven by anything except the causal effect of the teacher. So this, for me, pretty much is conclusive evidence that these measures have some predictive content. When you actually have a higher value added teaching staff, test scores go up immediately. And what I will show you now uh, in the subsequent slides is that various other long-term outcomes improve as well. All right. So this is how we deal with the bias issue. You can do the same thing symmetrically look at the departure of a high quality teacher and look at what happens to test scores. Test scores for the subsequent kids who weren't lucky enough to get this high quality teacher are distinctly lower than the uh, test scores of the earlier uh, cohort. So I'm gonna skip this stuff and move now to the second part uh, of, the, of the talk, which is we've established, we go through this in much greater detail in the paper, that these value added measures actually seem to be relatively unbiased. So they give you pretty good forecasts of the actual causal impact of teachers. And so now we're gonna test whether those teachers who raise test scores also improve their students' long-term outcomes. Uh, now one thing I wanna emphasize is that the estimates I'm gonna show you reflect the impacts of a better teacher in a single grade. And the way you wanna think about it from a policy perspective is typically when we think about improving education, you might do that over many grades and then the effects might accumulate in ways that I'll discuss uh, later. But the intervention I'm gonna talk about here is in third grade, you know, you get a, uh, one standard deviation better teacher as measured by value added. How does that affect you in the long run? All right, here's the first result. I'm just gonna show you a series of scatter plots which show you on the x-axis the teacher value added of say a teacher you had in fourth grade. What was the value added of the teacher you had in fourth grade? 
And on the y-axis in this case is the fraction of students who attended college when they're 20 years old. And you can see that there's an extremely clear relationship. If you had higher value added teachers when uh, you were in fourth grade, fifth grade, etc., you are significantly more likely to go to college. Uh, and um, the, I can talk about magnitudes in a, in a little bit, but the way to interpret this is if I have a one standard deviation better teacher, so there's a distribution of teacher quality, right? The various teachers have different levels of value added. If I move from the average teacher to the 80th percentile teacher, that, raise it, that raises the probability that I go to college by about half a percentage point relative to a mean of 38% in this population. Now that in and of itself may seem like a small number, but remember, this is why I was emphasizing the single grade thing. So if I had a better education over say 10 years in school, I'm five percentage points more likely to go to college relative to a base of 38%. That's a pretty substantial effect relative to many things that we think about in economics, and I'll show you more direct quantification of impacts in a second. Um, I'll, let me just show this. This is an analogous exercise, again, evaluating bias. So here we're predicting college attendance based on your parents' characteristics, again, just like we predicted test scores. And I'm just showing you here that there's no relationship between predicted college attendance and the quality of your teacher, which is, again, consistent with the view that this is actually the causal impact of the teacher and not the fact that the kids over here are for some reason more likely to go to college than the kids on the left-hand side of the graph. Okay, um, now the impacts of college attendance, as you'd expect, now this is showing you by age, what is the impact of having a one standard deviation better teacher on the probability that, you're gonna, that you are in college. Now most people go to college between the ages of 18 and 22, so it makes a lot of sense that we see the biggest impacts in that age range but then the impacts continue to persist, and even around age 24, 25, this would be people going to graduate school or, or something like that, law school, you still see continued impacts of the teachers you had when you were 10 years old, right? All right, now, uh, you're also more likely to go to a better college in terms of the quality of the college based on that earnings index that I talked about earlier. Now, this is one of the results we uh, spent quite a bit of time on. Um, this is earnings at the age of 28 uh, versus teacher value added, okay? So you will earn significantly more if you had higher quality teachers when you're a kid. And the magnitudes here are actually quite large. So if you have a one standard deviation better teacher for a single grade, you earn 1% more uh, per year, all right? And if you think about aggregating that over lifetime earnings of 1% improvement in earnings, uh, is substantial, and if you have better teaching over multiple grades, you know, you could get 5%, 10% earnings increases. Uh, so just now thinking about this on a broader scale, the reason I think this is so important is if you're able to improve teacher quality by one standard deviation overall and raise everyone's earnings by a few percentage points, that is an enormous change, right, relative to the kinds of things we worry about. So you think about the financial crisis, you're talking about a few percentage points of GDP, uh, that are lost in a one-time uh, hit, and that obviously is viewed as an enormous uh, issue, and that shows you that the stakes here, even though the numbers themselves might seem small, are actually quite, quite large. Um, the other thing that we see in the data, which is quite intuitive, I think, is that the impacts of teacher quality on earnings sharply increase as kids get older. So when you're very young, when you're 20 years old, having a high quality teacher actually lowers your earnings. So that makes quite a bit of sense when you think about the result I showed you on college attendance. The kids who had really good teachers have lower earnings because they're in college. But then they have a steeper earnings trajectory, and by the time you're 28, you're seeing these significant positive 1% uh, earnings impacts. Uh, I'm gonna skip that and show you a couple other outcomes. This is the probability that you have a teenage birth versus the quality that you had uh, versus the quality of teachers you have. So teachers not only improve your earnings and college attendance, they also make you less likely to have a teen pregnancy. Uh, they, and then this is our, a measure of the quality of the neighborhood in which you live. So the percentage of college graduates who live in your zip code, which is a commonly used measure of neighborhood quality, you live in a better neighborhood if you had better teachers as a kid. So along various dimensions, you really see these broad-based gains from having better teachers. Uh, I'm happy to come back to this and talk if pe people are often interested in the heterogeneity of these impacts. 
which subjects are mo most important? Is it more important for girls or boys? Lower high incomes. Let me come back to that if people are interested. Uh, and let me show you a few uh, other things that we've done that bring us now closer to the policy relevance of these findings. So one thing that people are very interested in is determining at what point of education uh, the rates of return to investment are highest. So there's a lot of discussion, but I don't think very, not much of it is evidence-based that early childhood education is the, is the most important place to invest. So what we're doing here is showing you the impacts of improvements in teacher quality, but by grade, in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, et cetera. And so the points that are plotted are the gains from a one standard deviation better teacher in that grade on an outcome like earnings. And what you can see is that you look at this pattern, it bounces around a little bit, and there's some statistical imprecision here, but you know, it doesn't hop, pop out to your eye that the returns are much higher at the beginning than later, or that there's any dramatic trend here. If anything, it looks relatively constant. Having better teachers is good in fourth grade, it's better it's good in fifth grade, and it's good in eighth grade, right? And the impacts that we find are actually fairly consistent in magnitude with what we found in our earlier study looking at kindergarten class quality. So my sense from doing this work is that you know, early childhood education is very valuable, but so is middle school education, and so, you know, maybe so is high school education. We can't analyze that here, but I presume that somebody can do that down the road. Um, the, okay, so now what I want to end with is really showing how we can translate this to concrete uh, policy proposals that people are discussing. So what can we do about improving teacher quality, and what would the potential returns be? So one proposal that's uh, discussed quite a bit uh, is a proposal by Rick Hanushek at Stanford, uh, which is to replace the teachers in the bottom 5% of the value-added distribution with teachers of average quality. So the idea is you dismiss the teachers who are at the very end of the very bottom of the distribution, and then you take another draw from the distribution. So on average, you're, you're going to get the average teacher, right, when you do that exercise in a large population. Okay, so we are going to calculate the uh, potential gains from implementing such a policy. So we're going to measure the impact of teacher quality using the estimates I just showed you on the net present value lifetime earnings for a class of average size in our data. That's 28 students. That's the average class size in this school district. And we make the following assumptions. Uh, we're going to assume that the percentage impacts of teacher quality which I said were 1% per standard deviation, remove, uh, remain constant throughout your life. So the reason we have to make that assumption is, at this point, we're only able to look at earnings impacts up to age 28 in our data, because the kids are currently 28. Uh, as they get older, you'll be able to directly look at impacts later in life. For now, we're just going to assume that that 1% impact stays constant. So remember, that is a conservative assumption, because I was showing you that those impacts seem to grow over time. So my guess is, if anything, it's going to understate the total uh, gains. Uh, the second is that we're just going to assume that the path of earnings looks like the average path of earnings in the US. We're going to take a 3% real discount rate, discount all the gains back to age 12, which is the point of that intervention, the point at which you might try to improve teacher quality. And then we're going to, this is going to be a partial equilibrium analysis in the sense that we're not going to take account of any general equilibrium changes that might occur when you try to improve everyone's skills. So one concern you might have is if we make everybody better educated, the, the wage rates for highly skilled workers will fall, and that could potentially reduce returns. That's not an issue we're going to talk about here. And we're also not going to incorporate any non-monetary gains. So for instance, the fact that you reduce teenage births, you might have uh, beneficial effects on crime and so on, all of which have value. We're ignoring that here. Okay. So what is the exercise we're interested in? We are, this is the distribution of teacher quality in the population. We're going to take the bottom 5% of teachers, and we're going to chop off uh, that lower tail and redraw from the average. And I want to know what the average uh, gain from that is, right? And so this turns out to be the answer to that question. If I take a teacher who's in the bottom 5% of the distribution and replace them with an average teacher, in a single year, I get net present value earnings gains of 300,000 US dollars, right? Aggregated over these 28 kids. So what's the math behind this? I replace this teacher with an average uh, teacher. Um, so the student's test scores go up. You get earnings gains of roughly 2% per student. 
add that up over their lifetime, multiply by 28 students, basically because your earnings are aggregated over so many years and you're teaching so many students, you end up getting pretty big numbers for the potential gains from this type of replacement. Now, one important issue here, which critics are, are often bring up, and which is a valid point, is that I'm assuming in the calculation I do here that I can actually identify the bottom 5% uh, of uh, the distribution of teachers. That is, I can truly find the teachers who are up to the lowest value added, um, the lowest skill uh, in the data. Now, in practice, we aren't actually able to identify the bottom 5%. We can only estimate who the bottom 5% are using relatively limited data, right? So if you think about implementing this policy, as you observe a teacher teaching more and more classes, you're going to get a more precise estimate of the quality of that teacher. But you don't want to wait 20 years before you decide whether you're going to keep this teacher or not. Typically, you make these kinds of decisions within, say, two or three years. But if you're making the decision based on just a couple of years of data, there's going to be quite a bit of noise in your estimates of value added. So some of the people who you think are really low value added teachers may not actually be low value added. They just may have gotten a bad draw of 28 uh, kids, you know, some of whom happen to have not done very well. And so we account for that. And so this calculation here shows you, suppose we cut off the bottom 5% based on estimated value added using only three classes of data. Then the actual distribution of teachers we end up deselecting is not the people in the bottom 5%. It's actually more dispersed because some of these people who are up here, because of bad luck, they end up having really low estimated value added. So that's going to reduce our potential gains. And so what this calculation shows you here is on the x-axis, how many classrooms of data have you observed for this teacher? And on the y-axis, we plot the gains from deselecting teachers based on that many years of data. So you can see that if I have three years of data, I, get, uh, I don't get to the 300,000 level because I don't have a perfect measure of each teacher's quality yet. Eventually, you know, if I had an infinite amount of data, that blue line is going to hit the red line, right? But I still get, you know, it's pretty good. I still get two-thirds of the gain. I get more than $200,000 of gain uh, from selecting teachers based on three years of data. Now, the other thing that you see here, though, is that there is a pretty significant gap. So the way I interpret that is there's value in using other types of signals of teacher quality. So Several studies have shown that principals have a pretty good ability to figure out which teachers are good and which teachers are not. So the kind of policy that I think makes sense is use these value-added measures, but also use principals' assessments to supplement those value-added measures. And together, you're going to capture even more of that gain, presumably. The other thing that you see here is kind of a, it's an interesting optimal policy problem. Should you wait to get another year of information about these teachers, or should you make a decision after, say, Three years of uh, uh, three years of data. Now, on the one hand, you might look at this and say, "Yeah, you know, I can keep getting further and further gains if I keep waiting." But you've got to compare the size of that gain with the amount that you're losing by leaving that teacher in there. So, if you leave that teacher there, you're bearing an expected loss in the next year of about two hundred twenty thousand dollars. But the expected gain from that additional information is only ten or twenty thousand dollars. So while it's true you get a gain, you're paying a pretty stiff price to get that uh, additional information. Okay, so the, our take, you know, our bottom line here is that using these value-added performance measures makes a lot of sense, and there's potentially quite a bit of gain to be had from evaluating teachers using these methods and deselecting that, that lower tail. Now, a different approach that you might uh, take is um, to uh, instead focus on the other end of the distribution, right? So you might say, why are you telling me to remove the, the, the worst teachers? Why don't we try to retain the best teachers? It was very intuitive. Now, it turns out here, if you do these calculations, that retaining a teacher who's at the upper end of the distribution symmetrically has substantial uh, potential gains, right? So you can gain $200,000 if you convince a teacher who was at the 95th percentile. If they come and tell you, you know, I'm thinking about leaving, you should say to them, look, I'll write you a $200,000 check, why don't you just stay for another year? <laughs> okay, so the problem is uh, that um, if you look at the actual policy that you can implement, you can't just target the teacher who says they're about to leave, right? You've got to pay all the teachers a bonus, all the high value added teachers a bonus. 
And so there's an earlier study that analyzes the impacts of these bonus payments to teachers, and they estimate that a $2,000 bonus would increase teacher retention by one and a half percentage points. So that's a relatively modest impact. And so you get an earnings gain of $3,200 on average, just multiplying one and a half percentage points by 192K. Okay, so the net takeaway here is if you give teachers a $2,000 bonus at the end of their third year, if they stay, you will generate average gains of 3,200. So that is a positive return, but it's not like a massive return. What, what's happening here is that most of the bonus payments are being spent inframarginally, meaning they're going to teachers who would have stayed anyway. 90% of the teachers in our data end up staying for a fourth year if they're there for the third year, and I'm pretty sure it would be similar in New Zealand. And so if you were to try to implement a policy that paid bonuses to these high quality teachers, you would make them more likely to stay, but you'd end up spending most of your money on people who stay anyway. And so it seems better to target the lower tail rather than the upper tail, one of the policy lessons you get from this. So let me wrap up with this slide. While I've been arguing, I think the evidence is quite clear that these value-added measures have substantial content and policy relevance, one needs to do a little bit more work before figuring out exactly how you use these measures as a policy tool. So I think the most important issue is the first bullet here, which is when you start using the value-added estimates to evaluate teachers, their quality might get eroded by the behavior of the teachers themselves. So if you think about a teacher who's saying, oh, you know, I know I might lose my job if I don't raise test scores, you create really high stakes incentives to, um, you know, potentially start teaching to the test or even cheating uh, and things like that. And so one really needs to uh, be concerned about that. So I think the broader message here that I take away is that the results highlight the large potential returns from developing uh, policies to improve teacher quality in a place like New Zealand. I know there's talk of more systematic teacher assessment, uh, developing student standardized tests and so forth, I think there's potentially great value there. Um, and, you know, the, the other takeaway I think is kind of stepping back from the grand policy lessons that we're all interested in, you know, from a more personal perspective, uh, a high income individual, say, of parents who are earning approximately $100,000 a year, based on our estimates, uh, our, our results suggest that you should be willing to pay about $9,000 a year to get your child a one standard deviation better teacher for a single grade, right? So regardless of what you think about these policy issues as a parent, I think you should be uh, interested in the quality of the teachers that your, your child has. So, so. Thank you.